These eight facts will change the way you see the Christmas story. So often, the images we have of Christmas come from nativity scenes and storybooks. But what if I told you that most of these images aren't accurate? That the picture we get from the Bible is actually much different? That Mary's life was at risk? That there was no inn? That the shepherds who visited Mary and Joseph looked much different than what you imagine? Well, if you're interested in finding out the answers to these questions and much more, then join me for this episode of Misreading Scripture. Now, before we start, if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click this link above and down in the description below, where you can download a book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It is absolutely free and is a quick and powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. The first thing you might not know about the Christmas story is that Mary should have been executed. I mean, one of the first things we learn in the accounts of Jesus' birth is that Mary and Joseph were engaged, but not married, when she found out that she was pregnant. And because of this, Joseph considers divorcing Mary. As far as he knows, she's been unfaithful to him with another man. But I have to be honest with you. The situation was way more severe and terrifying for Mary than that. Even though she had done nothing wrong, Mary was afraid for her life in this moment. Deuteronomy 22:23 says, If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. Mary lives in a small village. She's pregnant and the father of the baby isn't her husband. I mean, in the eyes of her community, this verse applies to her. And let me just clarify here, this isn't a community of strangers. Mary lives in Nazareth, a town of 100 to 400 people. Most of these people would have been related to her in some way. This was her family who was deciding whether or not to stone her. And even if they decided not to execute her, Mary would have potentially undergone an unbelievable amount of shaming. In the book of Numbers, there's actually a ritual that is intended to determine the guilt of a girl like Mary in a situation like this. It says that if a husband suspects that his wife has been unfaithful, he can bring her to the priest. The priest would tell her to let her hair hang down, and then he would have her drink bitter waters, which would be made of dust, holy water, and ink of the priest's written curse. Then the priest would say, May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb to miscarry and your abdomen swell. And if the woman was guilty, then she'd become sick. But if she didn't get sick, then she'd be acquitted. It's also highly likely that Mary could have been brought to a public location at some point during all of this. Her clothes would have been torn, her hair would have been let down, and she'd have been shamed. Now, fortunately for Mary, Scripture tells us that an angel appears to Joseph and he decides not to divorce her. And this actually highlights something important about the relationship between Mary and Joseph, which is that Joseph and Mary were essentially married. Notice how I just said that Joseph decided not to divorce Mary. Today, if you wanted to call off your engagement, you could simply inform the other person and go your separate ways. But at the time of Jesus' engagement, was something much more serious and official. When a Jewish couple became engaged at the time of Jesus, they were considered for all intents and purposes to be husband and wife. They were in a binding relationship. They were combining their lives together. The only things keeping them from being fully married were the wedding ceremony and the consummation of the marriage. And much of the reason for this stems from how people viewed marriage throughout most of the world at that time. Marriage was a transaction. This is why the man's family would pay the dowry for the woman. There was to be an even exchange of goods. In fact, there were two forms of dowries provided to the woman and her family. The first was called a mohar. This would have been paid by Joseph's father to Mary's father. Mary's family was losing a daughter and Joseph's family was gaining her. And so the mohar was meant to compensate them for their loss. But this money didn't solely go to Mary's family. A significant portion was set aside for Mary in case Joseph died or divorced her. The other dowry 
was called a matan. This was given by Joseph personally, and it was also intended for Mary. In many ways, it would be for her protection. If Joseph died or divorced Mary, Mary would have been very vulnerable, right? She might have no one to provide for her. She might have been unable to remarry. But the Mohar and the Matan ensured that she had something. And once these sums had been determined, a legal document called a ketuba was signed. This was essentially a marriage contract. Joseph and Mary were legally bound together as husband and wife. And this gives us some insight into Joseph's feelings upon learning about Mary's pregnancy. I mean, for Joseph, the news that Mary's pregnant is devastating. Right? To him, this is not just his girlfriend or his fiancée who he believes has cheated on him. This is his wife. Right? They've been building their lives together. Commitments have been made. Transactions have occurred. So to find out that she's pregnant is devastating to him. And yet, nevertheless, because of the visit of the angel, Joseph embraces Mary as his wife, and he even takes her on the journey to Bethlehem for the census. But there's something really important about this scene in Bethlehem that is much different than you think. There was no inn. The setting of the nativity almost certainly wasn't a barn outside of a hotel. In fact, let's look at what the scripture actually says. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I know what you're thinking. This appears to be exactly what those verses are saying. It's right there, right? There was no room for them in the inn. And for years, this translation has led to stories of Mary and Joseph traveling door to door looking for a place to stay. Right? Children playing innkeepers in Christmas pageants, quoting the line, there's no room at the inn. But the interesting thing is that's not actually what Luke is saying. You see, the word that is translated in in English is actually the Greek word kataluma. But kataluma doesn't mean in as in a hotel. Kataluma is a word that refers to a guest room in a house. This is the same word used to describe the room where Jesus and his disciples had their last supper. There's another Greek word, though, that does refer to an inn. It's the Greek word pandakion. This is the word that Luke uses in the parable of the Good Samaritan to describe where the Samaritan takes an injured man. But not here, right? Not in the nativity story. Here, Luke uses kataluma. So what does Luke mean when he says that Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room for them in the kataluma? Well, at the time of Jesus, there was a section of every house that was used to keep the household animals, animals like goats that were kept inside of the house at night for their protection. And in this part of the house, there would have been a manger, a feeding trough for the household animals. For people living in the first century, hearing Luke's nativity story when it's first being read, this would have been familiar, right? And this layout would have been something they understood and imagined. They wouldn't have imagined that Jesus was born in an outside stable because there was no room at a hotel. They would have understood that Jesus was born in the area where the household animals were kept because there was no room upstairs. Right? It was the time of the census. Many of Joseph's relatives would have been returning to Bethlehem. The houses of his family members living in Bethlehem would have been packed. And this was the only area where Mary could deliver her baby. But even the delivery itself was different than we imagine. Because another thing you might not know is that Joseph and Mary weren't alone. I mean, it is highly, highly unlikely that Mary and Joseph would have been left to fend for themselves in a barn in Bethlehem for several reasons. Right? First, the house that they're staying in would have been full of family. And at least some of that family would have been women. They're in town for the census. Most likely, this house is full of Joseph's relatives who are sleeping in the Cataluma. But even if these are people who don't know Mary and Joseph, it's very unlikely that all of these people would have looked at Joseph and Mary and just said, good luck. I mean, additionally, hospitality was a hallmark of Jewish culture and the culture of that region. If the people of this town had left Mary and Joseph to fend for themselves, if the traditional story were true, that Mary and Joseph were put in some adjacent stable or cave to deal with this on their own, it would have brought shame to the town of Bethlehem. People were too busy to take care of this couple in desperate need of help. 
I mean, it just doesn't fit. And yet, while there were people present with Mary and Joseph, they weren't the ones we typically imagine in our nativity sets. In particular, three wise men didn't visit the baby Jesus. If you were to ask most people, they would tell you that on the night of Jesus' birth, three wise men visited, bringing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it's easy to understand why, right? The second chapter of Matthew begins, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. But I want you to notice some things about this verse. Notice how Matthew does not say that there were three Magi. He doesn't even say that they were men, right? And he definitely doesn't say that they were kings. The word Matthew uses is the Greek word magoi. This is actually the root of our English word magician, because these weren't kings. If anything, they were people who worked for kings. And they weren't necessarily magicians as we imagine them today. Rather, they were something similar to astrologers or astronomers. Matthew also doesn't tell us anything about a manger or, or that Jesus was a baby. What Matthew actually says is, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now the word that Matthew uses to describe Jesus here is the word pideon. And pideon is the Greek word for a young child. Brephos, on the other hand, is the word for an infant or a newborn. Brephos is the word that Luke uses in Luke 2.16 to describe Jesus as he lays in his manger, right? He is a newborn. It's the same word used to describe John the Baptist when he leaps inside of Elizabeth's womb. But Matthew doesn't use brephos. He uses pideon. Because pideon is also the word that Matthew uses to describe Jesus when his family returns from Egypt. It's the term he uses when he says that Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children. It's the word that he uses when Jesus tells a young girl who is dead to stand up. And it's the word Matthew uses to describe the young boy that the Magi visited quite a while after Jesus was born. Among those who were present at the birth of Jesus, though, were the shepherds. But one thing you probably didn't know is that shepherds were outcasts. Often we think of shepherds as kind, gentle men who take care of sheep. Right? We picture King David as a young boy with a sheep slung across his shoulders. Or we think of the gentle nature of the 23rd Psalm and the idea that the Lord is our shepherd. But in reality, at the time of Jesus, people had a very different view of shepherds. Shepherds were poor. Right? Rabbinic tradition labeled them as unclean. Their sheep roamed and grazed on private property, which made them an unwanted nuisance. They were considered to be dishonest and untrustworthy. And the Mishnah indicates that shepherds were under a ban. They were regarded as thieves. The only people considered lower than shepherds at that time were lepers. And, I mean, let's be honest, right? They were the last people you would choose to add credibility to such a significant moment like the birth of the Messiah. Especially when you consider this next fact, which is that the shepherds could have been young girls. In fact, this is still the case in many parts of the world. Genesis tells us that Jacob's wife, Rachel, was a shepherd. It was believed that there was more important work for the man to do, so the work of shepherding went to the lowest member of the family unit. And when you think about it, this is a much more realistic picture of the birth of Jesus. I mean, in the hours after she's just given birth, it's hard to imagine Mary welcoming in a group of strange men, dirty and smelling of sheep. But welcoming in a group of young girls... Well, that's something much easier to swallow. I mean, Mary herself would have been a young girl. These would have been her peers. And as she gave birth, she would have been supported by the women in the house, Joseph's family members who lived in this home and or maybe had traveled for the census. Right? These were women who had delivered babies before and would have naturally assisted Mary in this moment. So as these female shepherds appeared out of nowhere, totally unexpected, uninvited, they would have easily fit right in. And Mary would have been much more comfortable welcoming them in. Finally, though, there is one other thing about the Christmas story that is different than you think, perhaps the most meaningful thing on the list, which is that swaddling cloths were a sign. According to Luke's gospel, the shepherds are told by the angels to visit the Messiah. 
They know nothing of Jesus and Mary. They, they have no idea of the station of this couple or what they've been through with this pregnancy that has taken place during their engagement. All they know is that they're visiting the Messiah and his family and they're unclean. And, and, and there is a strong possibility that they will be rejected just like they would be by everyone else. Right? This is why the angel's description of Jesus is so important. Right? The angels tell the shepherds that the Messiah will be in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. In other words, they will be visiting a baby. And beyond that, the baby will be in a manger. Now, this wasn't normal. Right? Babies weren't always placed in mangers. It tells them something about this baby's station in life, that he isn't as imposing as they feared. But there's more. Because the angel tells the shepherds that the manger and the swaddling cloths will be a sign for the shepherds. Now, why call it a sign? I mean, is it such a strange thing that that'll make it obvious, right? What other baby would be lying in a manger? Well, this is where things get really interesting. You see, the Mishnah tells us that swaddling cloths were used to wrap Passover lambs after birth to protect them from injury. When a baby lamb is born, it's often thrashing and it risks injury. And since these lambs were meant to be unblemished when they were sacrificed at Passover, the swaddling cloth was meant for its protection. The shepherds would have known all about this practice, especially since lambs used for temple sacrifices were raised in Bethlehem. The shepherds would have seen this as a sign not only to indicate where this child was, but who this child would become. This is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the one who would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And the shepherds are the first to witness this. What is so easily lost on us is just how beautifully upside down this story is. The Savior of the world comes to the dregs of society. The one who receives the greatest privilege are the ones that everyone else considers the least worthy. It's something we see throughout the Gospels. And it's a powerful message to all of us. Because I know that some of you may feel like the shepherds. Unwanted, unclean, unloved. But the Savior of the world has come for you. You are not too bad for God to love. You, are, you have not made too many mistakes for God to forgive. And even you have been chosen for great things in God's kingdom, just like the shepherds. Well, that's it for this episode of Misreading Scripture. Now, if you haven't done so already, make sure to click the link up here or down in the description below to download my free book, 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, videos that will change the way you see familiar passages of Scripture, and click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.